Bonjour. Hello and welcome to France 24 and Radio France International. We have a very special guest with us today. Since a few days before he will be setting off at the International Space Station, we have with us the astronaut, Thomas Pasquet. Hello. Bonjour. Hello. I'm joined by Frédéric Rivière from RFE. Hello, hello Sylvain, and hello Thomas Pasquet. So, Thomas Pasquet, how are you feeling on this final stretch, three days before liftoff? Well, I can't wait, obviously. We're just biding for time for today and tomorrow, and there's not a lot really left to do. So we're just practicing the basics. One last time, I'll go for a run, say my farewells to the family, spend time with them. And then we'll go over the last few details in the lead up to the Thursday. So a few final logistics before the final countdown. So, Ma Pasquet, do you have the same level of trust in the SpaceX launcher as you did in the Soyuz launcher that you used in your first space journey? Well, I think whatever the case may be when you're dealing with space missions, risk is always calculated. These are vehicles or launcher modules that are usually flying for the first time. So the risk is calculated. You calculate the part breakdown. You didn't. You don't really know when things are going to work uh, because they've never flown before. But this is a bit different because these are reusable launcher modules. So they've flown once, there's no reason it shouldn't work a second time. This is the Falcon 9 launcher and just recently it's taken a crew up to the International Space Station. So it's got a history and it's already launched modules up there. Granted, unmanned missions in the past, but they're quite reliable. So I'm not too stressed about that. Do you think that landing with a SpaceX won't be as rough as it was with Soyuz. Well, I don't know. I mean, if I were to listen to the others, well, then, you know, I was lucky to land the first time. It was just a demo model. Yes, it was a rocky landing, but at the same time, it was with a space shuttle that, uh, well, it was meant to land like a plane. And what we've got now is something which is going to be a much softer landing. There are back thrusters which trigger just under a meter before the ground, which should make enough for a comfortable landing. But the thing is, here we're talking about eight meter descent, that's two to three stories in one second. It's quite fast. And even with the parachute, it's still quite fast. So with the back thrusters, I think, well, it's going to be quite a rough landing nonetheless. Thomas Pasquet, you already spent six months on the International Space Station four years ago. This is your second mission. What will be different this time around on Mission Alpha? Well, there are quite a few things that are going to change. There's a lot that is the same as well. In terms of things that are the same, well, the overall mission goals are the same. Six months on board the ISS, it's a lot of research, scientific experiments that you can't do on Earth, things that you can't really test for on Earth. So scientists, they get us to carry out those experiments on board. Second, it's about preparing the next steps of space exploration, because obviously this is what the space station is all about. We can go through the scales, go through the motions, develop new technology to take us beyond the Moon, Mars, and that's what everyone's talking about at the moment. So the things that are going to change, well, the crew. Even though I have already flown with two members of my crew, uh, Shane Kimbrough and Oleg Novitsky, in my last mission, and it's quite rare to be able to do that, well, the way we reach the station is going to be a bit different. Two days or one and a half days there and half a day back, but it's quite short. Despite that, there's a lot of training behind that. Crew Dragon, Falcon 9, there's still a lot of risk there. And my role as well is going to be a little different. I'm quite experienced and this time around, I'm quite lucky in that I'm the commander on board the ISS. So that's the second half of my mission. It's going to be a leader, and it's going to be able to hand on my experience that I got in my first mission aboard to those people for whom it's their first time in space. During the six months you're going to spend in space, no fewer than 200 scientific experiments will be carried out. Can you tell us a little bit more which are some of the most important ones and which might might uh, have the quickest and most concrete impact on our daily lives. Yeah, of course. Uh, there are experiments that are quite varied. And these are all experience that we do, experiments that we do on the ISS. We do alloy and foam-based structure testings because these are structures that uh, behave quite differently. And in fact, they behave better in weightless environments. And we do tests, send back our uh, outcomes of those tests to scientists on Earth. And also for medicine, because viruses don't behave the same way. When you have cells grouping together in three dimensions, it represents better what happens in a human body than what you can do in a petri dish in a laboratory back on Earth, very flat. There are also 
number of experiences that I'm quite fond of. There are about 200, 232 in all, and 40 of them come from the European Space Agency, 12 come from the CNES, the French Space Agency. And of those 12 from the French Space Agency, there's one which I'm really quite excited about. We're going to be taking up mini brains for stem cell research onto the ISS. And again, they don't behave the same way when they're in a weightless environment, because they group together in a different way, they reproduce in a different way, and it can be readapted to using it back on Earth. So we use organoids, as we call them, mini brains that we'll be studying aboard the ISS. It doesn't look like a brain, but we call them mini brains nonetheless. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Fantastic applications ahead. There's something else, another test that we'll be doing, again, carried out with the CNS. We'll be looking at different packaging methods. We have foam packaging, obviously, that needs to resist the shocks of takeoff and landing, it needs to be protected and well packaged. But it can cost quite a bit. And the other thing is, we can't throw them out. We just can't throw them out and dump them into space. So we need to find ways of bringing them back down onto Earth. And on top of that, we've come up with a new form of packaging, edible packaging. It's kind of like a gingerbread sponge cake, 3D printed. It, look, it may seem quite mad, like a bit of a, a mad scientist sort of experiment, but it's a great way of reducing waste. It'll cut our waste by two. Fantastic on-Earth applications as well, reducing plastic waste. You and the team you're taking off with are quite experienced, so I imagine there'll be several spacewalks. Do you already know what to expect? I mean, you always have an inkling as to what it's going to be like, but when you're dealing with space, you really don't know until you've taken off. And that's the way I like to see things. You know, you're preparing for a mission, you don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. I always tend to think that, uh, well, we'll see about it when the day comes. Now, I'm not a glass half empty type of guy, it's just that so much can go wrong before everything finally works and before you take off. In terms of spacewalks, there are four that are planned for this current mission. So four, we're going to share them amongst the whole crew. We're not going to just give them to two of the crew members. We want to use all of our resources aboard. We don't just want to have two out in space and two always staying inside. It's not fair. So hopefully I will be lucky enough to do one or two of those spacewalks. And we've programmed these in the mission. The aim is to improve the electrics on board the ISS. The station is, well, currently 20 odd years old. The modules are quite a bit older as well. There are a few more recent ones as well. But really, the electric production is quite limited because the space station has grown over time and the equipment has been added to it. And now there are seven permanent members on board. So we need to add solar panels. And we're going to set up a new solar panel. They're going to unroll. It's quite amazing technology as well. They weigh roughly 350 kilos, I think. So we need to set them up during one of our spacewalks. They're quite massive. It's quite complex mechanisms as well. It's like real life extreme Lego in space. Can't wait. Is the International Space Station currently in good condition? Yeah, it is in quite good nick, but we do carry out a lot of upkeep. It's like on a ship or a submarine, you know, you scrub the decks, fasten the sails, wash the portholes. I mean, these are just ways of saying that we do a lot of upkeep because we want the station to last as long as possible. But despite that, obviously, some of the modules that are part of the ISS, they are a bit over 20 years old. They're out there in the extreme environment of space with temperature fluctuations situations on the hour. You go up 100 degrees to minus 100 degrees, whether you're in sunlight or in the shade. So obviously everything is designed to resist that, but it's quite harsh environment. And we can see that there's a bit of wear and tear that's starting to show, nothing too drastic. But we know that scientists have said that we have up until 2028 with no problems whatsoever. Again, it's all calculated risks, but engineers swear that we have it safe up until 2028. I think it'll go long beyond that. So there's been more and more criticism of the ISS lately on account of its cost on the one hand and also on account of the condition it's in, as you mentioned earlier on. So do you take these criticisms into account and why is it important to keep the space station going? Well, I don't think that people are being more critical of it. I think it's that people are talking about it more and that's a good thing. I actually think the exact opposite because there's less criticism of it now than when I started in my career, 2008. People said, why are you going up into space? What's it all for? And it's because people weren't informed. But since 2008, I've really tried hard to explain why we're carrying
carrying out these experiments, why we're exploring, and what it's all about. And I really think that since then, people are more in favor of space exploration. But obviously, when you're talking about a space station, granted, 25% people against it, sure, but you still have a lot of people who are for it. And the other thing is, I think it's fair enough, because we're doing using public money for a lot of this. And here, we are working for the CNRS or CERN, space organizations or research organizations doing particle accelerator research. And you have to explain why you're doing all of that research. So you need to explain it. But it's not always easy for people to understand. I'm not a nuclear physicist. I'm not a doctor. And, you know, sometimes for the medical experiments, I have to ask people to explain it to me so I understand why I'm carrying out these experiments in space. Now, it's up to us to do that when possible. Fundamental physics is not easy to put into layman's terms, but we have to try. And ever since my last mission, I've been trying to do that, and I'll be able to do it again if I have the opportunity to do so. Thomas Pasquet, as you mentioned, you're going to be commander of the International Space Station for a month. Other than it being a gratifying experience, uh, since it's a form of recognition, other than that, is it really going to change something for you? Is it going to change something for me? Well, yes and no. You're not going to whip everyone into shape. No, no, I'm not going to whip everyone into line. But does it change things? Well, yes, I mean, it is quite gratifying. It's recognition for a European. It's not always an opportunity for us to be in such a position, because as Europeans, we're just minority shareholders in this whole venture. Most of the shareholders are Americans and Russians. So therefore, we have less decision-making power, and it's understandable. NASA, they have a lot more power. And as Europeans in crews, we are very rarely in a decision-making position or leadership positions. So it's great acknowledgement of the ESA and me and my own skills. And I'm so happy to be here to see this change because I'll be working with an experienced crew. And I think that's good because, well, we're not here to just muck around. We're here to do serious business. And I think having an experienced crew is good for that because I won't need to constantly look over their shoulders or tell them to clean up their rooms. That said, one thing that will change as head of the crew, then I'll be able to have things done my way. There are some people who are more military background, other people who are a little different, a bit more relaxed. And you need to set your own tempo. And as commander, I will have final say in that. So I will be acting in emergency situations and I will have final say. And everything has to follow the commander's orders. And in day-to-day -day tasks, day-to-day -day missions, that's what we'll be doing. There's no discussion. And as leader, that's what I'll have to do. Uh, this will be your second mission on the ISS. What did you miss? And what do you miss from up there when you're on Earth? What's going, what I'm going to miss the most? Well, I don't think it's anything groundbreaking. I'm going to miss my family and my loved ones. Human contact. You know, just spending time with people. But then we're also very lucky because we can actually call people nowadays. We have a phone over IP contact. Once a week we have a Skype call with them. It's much better than what it used to be at the beginning of the program and when the Mir station was first out there. But what I am going to miss? Well, a sense of freedom. Freedom to do what I want. Something that I could do back on Earth. And I think that's what people realized during the lockdown. They realized just how precious that freedom was and how much they could miss it. And I think uh, when you don't have access to that freedom every day, it really wears you down. And it's a little the same for us up there. You can't do what you want. You can't eat what you want. You can't watch what you want on TV. And unfortunately, well, that's my that's my lot in life for the next six months. But uh, what about the other way around, uh, Thomas Pasquet? Because I think that's what Sylvain was also asking. Uh, on the other hand, when you're on Earth, Earth. Do you miss space? Oh, yes, it definitely. Well, obviously it goes both ways. Space, well, I really miss space. And things I miss from space, well, the physical feeling of floating in space, it's so enjoyable. And I'm not going to lie, I've, it's such a joy to be out there and to not feel the weight of your own body. You're floating, you're flying. It's like a childhood dream that's come true. It's such an enjoyable experience. And granted, it takes a while to get used to it, but it's so enjoyable. And another thing that I've missed while back on Earth is that feeling of being on a mission, being with your crewmates, being in the heat of the action, waking up every morning knowing exactly what you're doing because you're on the space station. And everyone down there at uh, Control Center, they are there to make sure that you can do your job. And it's really quite enjoyable that. 
the fact that you have clear priorities, you get less sidetracked than you are back on Earth. And that's something I'm really like. Thank you, Thomas Pasquet, for being with us on France 24 and RFE. Don't miss the exceptional coverage we've devoted to this event. First of all, with a series of reports that have started to be broadcast this morning and that will be kept broadcasting till Friday. And don't miss the coverage of the big day with our special correspondents in Cape Canaveral. Uh, we have Benoit Brochet for France 24 and Simon Rose for RFE. And then there are these little videos, these little clips that you will be sending us to share your experience over the next six months. My pleasure. And I really hope people will tune in and watch my mission because I'll feel less alone. Thank you, Thomas Pasquet. Uh, thank you to all of you for following this interview. And stay tuned to France 24 and RFE. Thank you.